Hello and welcome to another episode of Salute Ukraine. I'm Lily. And I'm Chris. Today we're going to be talking about a really tough subject. Who poisoned Jewish-Ukrainian relations in North America and how to fix it, at least in the pro-Ukraine community. So before we jump in, I just want to tell you how I prepared for this episode. This is the fifth time I am trying to record this episode. I didn't like the way it came out the first four times. I think I needed you, Chris. I'm glad to be here. I'm ready to learn a lot and to ask questions and, you know, to mend rifts. That's what we like to do here. Excellent. Thank you. So I consulted very widely about what approach I should take. Obviously, there's a war going on. You might have heard. I talked to many Ukrainians, Jews from Ukraine, Ukrainian Jews, American Jews, and I even consulted with one of the world's leading experts on Ukrainian nationalism, who thought it was a really interesting question. It was like, I don't know, Lily. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have all the answers, but I have given quite a bit of thought and gotten a lot of feedback about how to approach this, and we are doing our best. One thing I want to make clear up front is that all the experts in question support Ukraine. That includes all the Jewish Holocaust experts. That includes all the Jewish experts like, you know, David Katz, who are out there on the front lines fighting, you know, historical revisionism and have lots to say about history. I think the more you look at some of the issues we're going to be talking about in this show, the more you understand that what Ukraine is going through right now has absolutely no justification, not even close, and it's a vital priority to support Ukraine. In order to provide more context for our discussion today, we're going to put all of our references in the show notes. We want to remind everyone and to be clear that we are talking about history here, we're talking about ethnic tensions, here, the US, here in the US and in Canada. And we, as a team, um, support Ukraine. And our goal here is to mend uh, tensions and to get to a better understanding of each other. Um, and it's not to deter from what's going on in the Ukraine today. And it's not to say that we're retracting our support in any way, shape or form. And we just wanna make sure before we delve into this discussion, that our audience knows this. Absolutely, I think it's quite the opposite. I think talking a little bit about Jewish-Ukrainian reconciliation is important. There's far more Jews in the United States and Canada than you know Ukrainians, Ukrainian Americans, etc. So I, I think that's part of why we're doing it. You know, I, I go to a synagogue and these issues do come up, and I'm trying to get people out to protest. So. Uh, you know, don't don't get it twisted. I think this is absolutely for Ukraine. Um, another reason is that I talked to certain Ukrainian Americans, Ukrainian Canadians, and they're they're kind of aware there's an issue here. They don't know the details, and I think getting into this at least a little bit, like we're going to, is important for you to feel good and secure and proud in your Ukrainian identity. This is not to tear you down. It is to uh, plug any holes and build you up so you are not vulnerable on this issue and you don't unintentionally, you know, get into ethnic discord when talking about it. I also think from the, you know, pro-Ukraine community perspective, it's really important that we distinguish between ethnic nationalism and democratic civic nationalism. The democratic civic nationalism has room for minorities like Jews and Poles and others in Ukraine. And the ethnic nationalism kind of exacerbates tensions and takes us farther from that Ukraine we want to see in the EU and that, that democratic Ukraine that Zelensky is talking about. So we're also talking about this issue in that spirit of making a more perfect, a more democratic uh, pro-Ukraine movement that focuses on human rights. Okay, so first, if you are not open <laughs> to a new perspective on Ukrainian history that contradicts what you have been taught, 
congratulations, you just might be an ultra nationalist and are probably no friend of mine or the podcast. Fortunately, there's very few such people. I think ultra nationalists got about 2% of the vote in the last Ukrainian election. So um, I'm not thinking too many people listening right now fall into that camp. So I now want to address if you're open, but you feel like, hey, I'm very sensitive right now because of the war, because of all the Russian propaganda. I don't want to get into too much history. Just kind of give me the uh, the TLDR and what do I need to know? To make a really long story short, the story that you were taught about World War II and the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, or as they're called, the OUN, and the Ukrainian Insurrection Army, or Ukrainian Insurgent Army, excuse me, the UPA, it's basically false what you were taught. And that false story is essentially, in my opinion, the source of bad relations between Jews and Ukrainians, at least historically in the United States and Canada. I say historically because the Jewish community is totally unified on this point of supporting Ukraine, and that includes uh, reconstructionist, reform, conservative, orthodox, ultra-orthodox. Every denomination has been raising money for Ukraine. That includes the Israeli Jewish community, the American Jewish community. It even includes the Russian Jewish community. Mm. So, but historically there were tensions in the U.S. and Canada especially. And the reason is essentially this, what I'll call the myth of the Oun and the myth of the Upa. Um, Again, for this crowd that doesn't want to get into the history and just wants the TLDR, I'm going to make a few suggestions for you as how you can be part of the solution. Number one is listen to Jews. When Jews talk about the Holocaust or Jews talk about Ukraine or Jews talk about the Oun or, or whatever, I really suggest if you're open to the idea that some of the things you were taught are not true, I, I really suggest you listen and not clobber them. And I and I would even say that if you find that you're reticent to listening to what Jewish people have to say on this subject, then maybe you should really think about one where you're getting your information and maybe um, think about like your internal process and listening to other people uh, who are different from you. And maybe that um, that pushback that you emotionally feel into listening to Jewish people's experiences, especially in this particular subject, may have more to do with uh, some of your early education about who, what Judaism is and who J Jewish people actually are. And those ideas in themselves are false. And because you have maybe some internalized uh, um, some internalized ideas. Resentment? Is resentment, that a good word? yes. Okay. Resentment towards Jewish people. Or maybe you've been around the internet in general that is sometimes a very hard anti Semitic place for no reason. And maybe those ideas have seeped into your consciousness and you maybe you're not aware. Um, and you've gotten a hold of some weird globalist propaganda that makes you like, well, Jews are this or that. That's also maybe something that you should really think about uh, discussing with yourself, trying to understand where your ideas about Judaism come from, where your ideas about Jewish people come from, and why you feel that when they are speaking, you shouldn't be listening to them. I think that's a great point. And it brings me to my second suggestion. Please don't accuse Jews who are saying something that makes you feel uncomfortable of repeating Russian propaganda or being puppets of the Kremlin. First of all, if you're still listening, you're at least open to the idea, at least open to the idea that what you've been taught about the Oun and the Upa is not true. And hence, it's not Russian propaganda. It's actually just history, including Jewish history and Jewish memory. Additionally, it, it ties into some really unpleasant anti-Semitic ideas in European history where 
Jews are kind of portrayed as being puppets of the Kremlin. And unfortunately, this is an idea I've seen in Ukrainian ultranationalist circles. So I really encourage you to consider whether maybe you've been conditioned to this idea that something that a Jewish person says is Russian propaganda. I've had, unfortunately, some people say things like that to me. I tried not to take too much offense. It did hurt. But um, yeah, I, I really suggest you not do that. Um, third, if you're, again, open to this idea that maybe you don't know that much about the Holocaust in Ukraine, I suggest you not use the Holocaust as an example in your activism. It's likely to offend and upset Jews. Um, or at least don't do it to other Jews, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think the Oun and the Upa are fantastic, then probably you don't know much about the Holocaust in Ukraine. And um, I, I would suggest just uh, have a very light touch when talking about the Holocaust. Um, and, and last, I want to suggest to you, if you're not ready right now, learn more when you are ready. Maybe it's after the war, maybe it's on a long weekend, maybe it's when your you know, uh, husband gets back from the front lines. I don't know, it's going to depend on you, but uh, I, I hope you will feel ready at some point to educate yourself on this, even if it's a very difficult topic. And I think that if you get through this episode and your feeling is like, I thought I knew about the subject and I don't know, that's a great place to start because the emotional tie that you have with maybe a history that's not accurate lessens and you maybe are able to listen more and maybe take in more different or newer information. That's also step into the right di direction because I also find myself sometimes uh, learning about history that I had very close emotional ties to. And then my reaction goes from anger to being like, I actually didn't know about this subject. Or like what my parents told me was not accurate. Or um, maybe I, my opinions that I've said out loud in public were hurtful to other people and I didn't even know. And I'm not saying that's okay, but that's something that I can live with if, if I've decided that from now on, I'm going to maybe listen more before I speak and maybe admit that actually I don't have a really informed opinion on this subject and um, I will learn more over time. Yeah, when people say the past doesn't matter, you know, I disagree, but there, there's the kernel of truth there and it's that you can grow and you can leave some things in the past and, and in that sense, it, it, it ceases to matter if you can move past it. Okay, if you don't wanna get into history and stuff, it's been great. Uh, thank you for joining us and I'll see you in the next episode. <laughs> if you do want to actually hear some of the details now, let's jump in. So Chris, you you prepared a little bit for this episode. You, you read, uh, watched some videos and read some history, some academic papers I suggested to you on the, the Oun and the Upa. Uh, what are your broad, high level, what gist did you get from reading about these groups? My broad level idea is that um, their involvement in some very bad behaviors, but were, I don't wanna use the word whitewash, but maybe um, erased from history. And that I came at it, one, not knowing a lot about the subject at all, and being a little bit shocked at the idea that you can create a national identity by erasing some of the negative things that a group of people have had in order to bolster or to uh, make a closer bond in a country, but at what cost, right? The cost can be great and that cost could be at the lives of thousands and thousands of people who considered Ukraine their home. Um, and I feel like I'm learning a lot from you and now I'm gonna switch the question back to you and say, can you, because you're the historical expert in my life, can you give me a more detailed understanding of like where the Oun and the Opa started and where we are today? Sure. Uh, the Oun was founded, I believe in 1929, uh, and their goal was an independent Ukraine with 
no minorities, and that would be a totalitarian state. Um, they were extremists. They were not representative of mainstream uh, Ukrainian opinion. I think that's a big part of the myth is that like, oh, everyone support. No, no, that's not the case. They were very much extremists in the nationalist camp and um, they were fascists. And in every sense, in every sense, they were fascists mm -hmm. from the stiff right arm salute to the uniforms. They loved Hitler. Um, you, you'd almost, they were racist, they were anti-Semites. You would really struggle to come up with any definition of fascism that didn't, that didn't include the own on every point. Mm. The UPA was founded in 1943, so well into World War II. And most members of the UPA, there's been studies that shows about 70%, were so-called Chaunikis, meaning they were collaborators. They were collaborators with Nazi Germany during World War II. Um, and yeah, most UPA members had previously been in other uh, fascist formations and collaborate collaborationist formations. And they represented an extreme fringe. Again, the, the myth of the Oun and the Upa is that they're folk heroes and everyone loved them. I mean, this is a time period where Babinyar, as Ukrainians call it, um, was filling with the bodies of Ukrainians, right? Because people like the Upa uh, and the, the fascist formations that the Upa you know, uh, was built out of had killed huge numbers of Ukrainians. You know, if you were too intellectual or you were considered, you know, um, uh, too communist or, you know, too, you know, it's on and on and on. So um, they had a large body count. And I think significant to this discussion is that they are among the perpetrators of the Holocaust. Mm. Um, this is something that was really concealed as early as 1943. They were already, after the Battle of Stalingrad, trying to rewrite the history because they understood that Nazi Germany was going to lose and that it was a bad look uh, to be so close with uh, Nazi Germany, although then they later re-collaborated with them later. But the documents from this time period really show their very strong affinity for Nazi Germany. And um, that that's how I would put it, is that they were fascists, they were extremists, they were they loved Hitler, they were Nazi files, and they committed many atrocities, including the massacre of Jews in Lviv. They participated in massacres of Jews in Volin. Uh, they participated in a second genocide, namely the genocide of Poles in Volin. Mm. And this flowed from their ideology, right? They didn't want self-determination for Ukrainians. No, no, no. They wanted a totalitarian state uh, that had no minorities. And um, another thing I want to point out, you know, I've really emphasized that this was a minority stream and a small minority stream at that. But that there was nothing terribly unusual. Every country in Europe had collaborators. I think if mm -hmm. people recoil, I'm like, no, it can't be. It's like, okay, well, if it can't be in Ukraine, why was it like that in Poland? And why was it like that in Lithuania? And why was it like that in France and in Belgium and in the Netherlands? And it's like, you know, take a deep breath. This happened all over Europe. It's just that in Western Europe, there was some reckoning with it after the war. And in Eastern Europe, there was Soviet propaganda. Mm. And so a question that I that comes to mind is, was their goal, this totalitarian state, was the goal is to separate itself from the Soviet Union and in aligning itself with Germany, um, you know, f a way to pursue that goal? Or was, not to diminish the racism, or was the racism such a big central part of their, of their ideology that they wanted to align with the Nazis. 
because that's one of the questions that I had is like, what would be the motivation? I guess, I guess it's hard to try to understand Nazis, to be honest. But sometimes I try to be like, what is the motivation of this behavior, especially in the historical context um, of when the Oun and the Upa started, like in the late 1920s and in the 40s? What do you think? Uh, great question. I think they were not as motivated by racism as the Nazis were. For the Nazis, it was like an end in itself. And you see this in the way that they kept the Holocaust going despite, you know, losing the war, you know, from 43 on. And they continued to put big resources into killing Jews. And it was it was an end and goal in its own right. And that, I think, is part of what makes uh, the Nazi regime kind of the most extreme of the fascists. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at more broadly fascists, like Italian fascists or the Oun and the Opa, um, they wanted a state without minorities, but like how to get there, was, it was not an end in itself to eliminate a certain group of people. Um, and I think that that is a distinction. I don't know that it makes the situation any better. I'm not here to rank which fascist is better than another fascist. Yeah. But yeah, it is worth pointing out that their primary interest was a totalitarian, ethnically, quote unquote, pure uh, Ukraine for ethnic Ukrainians. In that sense, they had very strong affinity with other fascists. I mean, there's even documents from that period where they wrote down were the most natural of friends with a uh, Nazi Germany, and they were strongly anti-communist, which is another hallmark of fascism is anti-communism. So uh, yeah, I think the affinity was very natural and the that was the preferred partner of the Oun and the Upa. Hmm, interesting. Um, I didn't ask the question, I don't want it to come off that I, like I'm asking the question to excuse their behavior. But I think since we're getting into the weeds of the historical context of what's happening, I just wanted a, a, some clarification so I can understand better like the landscape of Europe between that time, because I do sometimes feel like I don't know the difference between like a regular fascist and a Nazi. <laughs> and personally, I'm like, Mussolini and Hitler, what's the difference, right? And so in this case, I want, it, I want us to be able to like contextualize where we're going in this and learning this history. Um, right. So I, I think, you know, the the 19th century, certainly the second half of the 19th century um, and then on is, is marked by the rise of nationalism. People are organizing into these larger states and you see the formation of Germany and the formation of Italy. And this was a very mainstream sentiment, nothing um, out of the ordinary about this at all. Uh, the fascists kind of went farther and they wanted, number one, totalitarianism. That's a very important part of fascism. They were anti-liberal, they were anti-democratic, they hated communism, they were anti-communist. And they often have like one leader, the so-called Führer Prinzip in German. The Own also endorsed this principle, like Stepan Bandera would have been their, their Führer. There's a document where he pledges allegiance to Hitler as his Führer. Hmm. So yeah, I would say it's a kind of extreme ultranationalism that's authoritarian and racist and almost invariably uh, specifically anti-Semitic as well. So it kind of takes a mainstream trend. The, the liberals and the Democrats were also nationalists in the sense that they wanted states. And most of them wanted nation states with like uh, an official language and a dominant uh, ethnic group. But Still, they wanted democracy or socialism or, or, you know, some kind of rotation of power or some kind of checks and balances, some kind of individual rights. The fascists are the ones who say no all the way. And um, within them, the Nazis were the most extreme in that they brought in the like scientific racism. Mm. Most of the fascists were like romantic nationalists and the kind of blood and soil type folkish nationalism as it's called in german history um 
but uh, the, the Nazis kind of combined with the sort of social Darwinist, scientific racist kind of side and really like emphasized, uh, you know, um, measuring people's skulls and all this really nasty stuff. They elevated this like really high in their cult. And then also they were just really powerful. Germany was a very powerful state. So some of the most extreme stuff we ever saw came from them. I don't know that it, they would have gone down in history as the most extreme form had some other fascist group gotten power in a more powerful state if it had happened in the UK or in Russia or somewhere else. That's a great point. So how did we get from the own and the OPA doing some of the horrific things that they do they did to Ukrainians and Jews in the Ukraine if, while also being like a very small minority a political minority in Ukraine at the time to this to now today where the history is basically acting like that did not happen the common history this is where it gets interesting this is where we go from honestly an unremarkable world war ii history just another country in world war ii with local collaborators that participated in atrocities and we get into jewish ukrainian tensions in north america what essentially happened was that the so-called third wave of ukrainian migration to canada and the united states was uh the supporters of the UN and the UPA were very well represented. And one reason was that they were wanted by the Soviet Union. They were seen as traitors, right? Again, the myth of the UN and the UPA is that they were the folk heroes, but it's not true, right? Most people were loyal to the Soviet Union and there were many communists and there was a very diverse political scene to say the least. Even most of the ultranationalists didn't want to actually collaborate with an invading country. These were extremists among extremists and they had the most to fear. The Soviet Union would call people like that ex-Russians. That's how mm -hmm. if you collaborated, you were dead to the Soviet Union. So obviously they wanted to get out. Many of them fled to the US and Canada, where there was a large existing Ukrainian population from the first and second waves, and even other third wave uh, uh, migrants included uh, communists and just non-political people. And But among them were many people from this group. And they really had two priorities. Number one was to not get arrested and prosecuted for war crimes. So they, and you know, it's kind of a interesting situation because you also have Jewish refugees from Europe, Holocaust survivors, and they're coming to the US and Canada. And you have these situations resulting where they're pointing at, you know, the local mechanic and being like, hey, I remember you, you murdered my family. Mm -hmm. So the first, first thing they were worried about was not being held accountable for the massacres in Berlin and you know elsewhere, also in Poland. So they constructed this myth that they had nothing to do with it. I don't mean that, hey, mm. we're not all war criminals. No, 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 no. They had absolutely nothing to do with it, if anything. They saved Jews and were great friends of Jews. So it's like this like whopper of whoppers. And they were somewhat effective, not entirely, but they were somewhat effective in getting more support in the community by stoking nationalism and saying, we're under attack. Our mm -hmm. nation's under attack. They're attacking us because we're Ukrainian. And I could really see you have all these survivors from Ukraine who are survived the Holodomor and survived atrocities by the Nazis and by the Soviets and this tremendous suffering that happened in Ukraine. Uh, I, I, can, I can see why this group saying, hey, we're being victimized for being Ukrainian. I, I can understand why some people would say, oh yeah, that, that checks out, that makes sense. So they were, they were able to do that and then their second kind of piece of their agenda was to keep fighting the Soviet Union through ideology. So they were really strongly anti-communist. 
Um, that's part of the reason the U.S. government and other Western governments would support them and work with them. For example, the CIA is one of the groups that mm -hmm. funded the Chronicle of the Upa, which put all these legends out there. Um, they were not entirely successful. Many people from this uh, group were prosecuted and did spend time in jail. Um, but mostly the Chanikis, mostly the kind of more individual collaborators. Uh, people in the own and the Upa were uh, a little more successful at evading prosecution. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in the OSI and these kind of groups, but um, yes, they were interested in not going to jail and they were interested in creating a myth of themselves in which they were like, towering heroes like you know you, you can't even look at them it's like looking into the sun you know <laughs> and they constructed this myth where like not only were they good people and folk heroes who didn't participate in atrocities and weren't racist and weren't anti-semitic and weren't fascist but it was more than that they constructed a kind of identity for a generation here in the u.s and canada at least some, again, some that they were able to reach that they like Ukrainian identity itself like rests on their shoulders. And like I said, a, a lot of people in the West were interested in supporting this because rightfully they wanted a free and independent Ukraine. They were anti-communist and, and, and so on and so forth. They wanted to preserve Ukrainian history and tradition and all this wonderful stuff. And uh, then comes 1991, and they start exporting this ideology back to Ukraine, where it was mm. unknown. So in Ukraine, it's never been that successful. There's never been majority support for the Bandera cult. Uh, the far right's never had wide support in Ukraine. It's always been very controversial there. Bandera was canonized in 2010, and then it was overruled by a court in 2011. People in the South and the East, like Russian speakers, hate this guy because their families and the communists and all that were massacred. And it was never as popular, nearly as popular in independent Ukraine. It has much more influence actually here in the diaspora as one of the things that was so like interested to learn. Another thing I want to mention is this this is the reason that Jewish Ukrainian relations went sour in North America. It's because the Jewish and Ukrainian communities polarized, mm -hmm. right? And Jews had their books by their survivors and they cited their accounts and the kind of mountain of Jewish literature about World War II grew. And then you have this Ukrainian studies stream, which is built in part, in part, on the myth of the Oun and the Upa. And I'd really encourage you to go to the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine. Uh, it's encyclopediaofukraine.com. And this is sort of the crowning achievement of this stream. Uh, and compare, right, we're citing sources. I'll add them to the video and to the show notes. I want you to compare what is in the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine, which is a tertiary source, right? It's built on primary and secondary sources from this community. And compare that to what's in the mainstream academic papers. And I think about three minutes in, you'll see how the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine is just absolutely involved in historical falsification. They twist and they distort. Check out the article on the Holocaust. Check out the article on anti-Semitism. Check out the article on the Oun. Check out the article on the Upa. And it's like, it's like you're on the far side of the moon. <laughs> they're not fascists. They're not anti-Semites. They're not, they did they nothing. There's no mention. There's nothing atrocities. They weren't Holocaust perpetrators. The, the article on anti-Semitism says that there was no local Ukrainian tradition of anti-Semitism and no anti-Semitic uh, political parties. Mm. It's like, I mean, just whopper of whoppers. So there's this long-term like, and what happened was that as Holocaust studies as a discipline took off in the 70s, essentially it, there was a lot of interest from all over the world, from all kinds of different people. And what we now would maybe call the, the Jewish account just it is the mainstream account. I mean, mm -hmm. there's interpretations that are Jewish, like Holocaust theology, whether or not the Holocaust means you should be a Zionist. Like there's perspectives on top of the facts, but the fundamental narratives of the Holocaust by mainstream historians like uh, 
uh, Bauer and uh, was it Yehuda Bauer and Hilder? I forgot his name. Uh, they're like real titans of this discipline. That's just that's just mainstream academic. They're cited in everything you would read on scholar.google.com. And uh, Ukrainian studies became more and more isolated, which is too bad because there's really great. Ukrainian studies scholars, and I think there's going to be a lot more in the future, but the people who were involved in this ultranationalist stream became more isolated. I mean, the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine, I mean, their articles on World War II are a joke. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but like there's just it is just a mountain of lies uh, and even cursory examination will show that. So in the last 10 years or so, 10, 15 years, there's been some scholars like Per Anders Rudling, um, like, uh, what's it, uh, uh, Georgi or Hori, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Kasyanov, who's a member of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, as well as being a Harvard professor, um, among others, who uh, have been writing about this polarization between Jews and Ukrainians just as a as a subject in its own right. Mm. Uh, and they were the ones who to really problematize and say, you can't be like celebrating Holocaust perpetrators as national heroes. And any attempt to say that they're not is false and mm. like really uncomfortable questions, I think. In Ukraine, a lot of times history was used to mobilize people politically against Russia, which, hey, I'm here for that. I'm a pro-Ukraine activist, but um, th that era is past, right? There's a war, the Ukraine's never been more unified against Kremlin, and now it, it's really starting to look problematic, this historical tradition. I can't help but make a connection to the way that the Banderas cult has taken its perpetrator status and victimized themselves through it, um, and then blame the victim uh, for you know telling the truth. It reminds me a lot of the um, Russian propaganda we've watched, where Russia will say that Ukraine is the perpetrator in its invasion of the Ukraine. And I can't help but look at those two pictures together and realize a pattern of behavior and some in uh, like, you know, the psychology of maybe like war crimes or war crime uh, of doing horrible things to groups of people where the, where the person who's exercised like its power badly or their power badly can just turn around and rewrite history and say like, oh, every he's gaslighting everyone uh, to use a very common term nowadays. But I can't help but as the, at the same time as the people on the Banderas side are saying, oh, wow, all of this talk about the Holocaust is just uh, Soviet propaganda. I can't help but think that they're taking a page out of the book of, uh, of Russia's book themselves. Or or anyone who's got something to hide. Yeah. You know, I, uh, from my own tradition, right? My parents are Jewish Israeli. Uh, there's this line from Golda Meir, who actually was born in Kyiv. She's a, a Jew from Ukraine. And there's this really ugly line where she's like, you know, what I, I, I hate the Palestinians for what they make our boys do to them. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, oh, so let me get it right. Your soldiers are victimized by the people they're doing bad things to. It's like, it's such a twisted, you know, it's a very ugly place to be. But why does it matter, right? So we talked about history and I, some people have definitely been like, what's it matter, Lily, what's it matter? Well, I think one reason it matters is it leads to resentment, right? Mm. It poisons relations now. If you've been taught that this is true and then someone Jewish like shares their perspective on Ukrainian history or their families as survivors, um, it, it can lead to sort of a defensive anger. And I don't think we want people on a democratic movement for human rights to be in that place. There was one you know, uh, uh, Ukrainian who, who really thought that this story she had been taught was true. She was like, it's them who need to change, not me. And it's like, 
you know, that's an ugly thing to say. It was, it was, it was they need to change, referring to the Jewish community, not us referring to, uh, and like that, that's an ugly place to be. That That's resentment. And that's not going to make people many friends. And speaking of which, like the ultra nationalists, they don't want you to be my friend, mm. right? They know that if, if Ukrainian Americans and Ukrainian Canadians spend time with Jews and that there's Jews in the pro-Ukraine community, that eventually some of these myths will get busted. And it's for that reason that the ultra-nationalists are, have historically stoked a lot of tension by attacking and smearing the Jewish community. And it is sort of inevitable, right? Because if you're gonna say that the survivors of Valin and Lviv lied, and that all these documents, you know, are, are lies. Well, how, how do you do that without smearing the victims? Mm. I mean, how? They were there. They said that this happened. I mean, the only option left to you is to say something nasty about victims of the Holocaust. And gosh, is that an ugly place to be. Mm. And also, if you're going to make that assertion, maybe you should also provide your own, like, historical or documents that are not fabricated to <laughs> substantiate your claim because it's just as we as we talked about at the beginning of the episode we understand that this is like a very a topic that's rife with a lot of emotions that are honestly can sometimes be outside of the scope of the conversation right like anti-semitism is a very common i feel like personally uh ideology in a lot of uh, in a lot of like European tradition and American tradition. And so I, it's not that I understand, but it's since it's so common, we can understand why you may have some internal feelings that you haven't dealt with when approaching the subject. But this is a place where you can look at facts and you can be like, oh, my fact, the facts that I learn in this episode can change my emotions. And so we want to invite you to like, understand why this is important and understand why anti-Semitism is not, is not something that we need to perpetuate in this community. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so additional reasons like why this is important is it's really important to understand the connection between racist ideology and racist violence. Mm. I, I, you can't take a group that committed racist violence, whitewash it, say, okay, they didn't commit atrocities, but what's left is great. No, right? Because it's the racist ideology that led to the racist violence. It's the racist ideology that led them to conclusions like there can't be minorities in our country. And we, we have to understand those connections, I think in a, in a democratic context, in a context that values human rights for the future. Mm. Uh, another reason is that statues of perpetrators is is very problematic in a democratic society. The statues of Bandera, uh, in my view, definitely need to be torn down. And it's just in a democratic future Ukraine, I think they will be. Uh, right now, there isn't that willingness to look at history critically. But, um, you know, look at the United States. There's this ongoing controversy about removal of Confederate monuments. Mm -hmm. And it, it becomes really difficult when the state endorses um, a figure uh, and they put a monument in a public square. It becomes very difficult to remove it because when people say, oh, you can't change history, you change. It's like, well, the thing is, the state at some point decided to celebrate it. And mm -hmm. that's that's the problem. That's the issue. Now, people like Bandera have always been very controversial in Ukraine. Um, uh, definitely Yaroslav Stetsko, Shukevich, you know, these are all of the same ilk to me. And I think uh, the celebration of them is simply inconsistent with pluralism. And because they've been so controversial, there's actually very few <laughs> statues and every one that went up was quite controversial. And the ultranationalists did everything possible to put up as many as they could while they could before they were called out. And me and you, we're now left with the mess to clean up. Mm. Um, I think another reason it's important is that this issue has caused tremendous pain 
to survivors. And here I'm not just talking about Holocaust survivors, but I'm also talking about because of intergenerational trauma, their children and grandchildren. And um, to be in environments where people who killed your family are like celebrated as heroes uh, is is sadistic. It's, it's a horrible, horrible thing to do to people. And it, the same thing was done in Poland where certain nationalists who killed Jews were then canonized and Poland passed laws saying you're not allowed to talk about it. Uh, the same thing was done in Lithuania. You know, again, Ukraine's not alone in this. Every country has had to deal with it or refused to deal with it in its own way. And I think the kind of most direct victims are the the people who know this history well and have inherited this kind of intergenerational trauma. And they're not all Jews either, right? Some mm -hmm. of them are Poles. Some of them are Ukrainians whose families were murdered in you know these anti-communist crusades. And uh, it's a kind of uh, you know historical and spiritual and psychological violence that is being done to them. I think this is preventing more Jews from getting involved. You know, I, I talk about Ukraine with, you know, other Jews at my synagogue. And, you know, I, I think they want, again, most American Jews descend from people who left before World War II. So they're not actually connected to this, but they do know Holocaust history. And they want the kind of, you know, pogroms that their ancestors fled to be recognized and not whitewashed. And the minute you're whitewashing one atrocity, why not whitewash them all? And it's uh, it's very difficult to say, hey, this is a pluralistic, inclusive Ukraine if you're not willing to hold up, uh, you know, the stories and experiences of victims. And this reminds me of the conversation we had in the last podcast about how in America there's this idea of Ukraine as it's it's part of the Soviet propaganda that Ukraine is a nation full of Nazis, quote unquote. But I think that in, to get away from that ideology, there should be like uh, an admittance of like, there were Nazis in the Ukraine. They were a very small percentage of the population. Just they like did, today. Yes, they did something horrible. We recognize the horrible thing that they're doing, but our independence from Russia is is us moving towards a nation that is going to resolve its past and work to move towards a better and more diverse future. I feel like that's something that a lot of Americans, even some of the Americans on the right, the moderate right, can understand and get behind. But I think because there's such a, a conflict of admitting that there might have been something bad that have happened by my, I mean, there was something horrible that happened to a group of people. It's very hard for, for even people I think who are secretly supporting Ukraine can have a hard time publicly supporting Ukraine because they feel like there's a, a need to admit and to rectify wrongs. Or at least be just open about it. Yeah. You know, I I I think it really, like you're saying, you know, it, it robs the Russian propaganda of its power. You know, if Russian propaganda says, oh, you're all Banderites, and you're like, well, fuck Bandera. <laughs> it's yeah. not the most powerful thing. You know, Russia is deliberately using this propaganda to smear all Ukrainian nationalists in the sense of people who want an independent Ukraine. They want to say that if you want freedom, self-determination, human rights, you know, all these things that Ukraine and Ukrainians are entitled to, then you're no better than these people. Mm -hmm. I think the best reaction is to say, actually, we got nothing to do with that and we don't need to rest on this little ragtag band of fascists from World War II. We don't need to care about them. Everyone has a right to human rights, self-determination, deciding whether to be in the EU and NATO without being coerced by none of that rests on history. Yeah. And I think when we recognize it and we're open about it, we, we rob the power of this propaganda. I think Russia has been able to kind of really upset uh, a lot of people in Europe and who descend from Europe uh, and here, including me, right? The subject upsets me because, because of this propaganda history that was taught 
in the diaspora and then later in Ukraine, mm -hmm. right? If people were well educated about this, it wouldn't have any power. Russia is very much exploiting and using history as, you know, uh, a justification for war and a way of upsetting people and demeaning them and denigrating them. And I think historical truth and reconciliation with Jews in the United States and Canada who already support Ukraine, that's the way to rob it of power. I agree. So I want to talk about uh, some common objections I hear and address them. But before I get there, I, I want to kind of talk about my own history, right? My background is Jewish Israeli. And I think some people think like, well, you're trying to position yourself as some kind of ultimate victim, right? Mm -hmm. Because there weren't Jews doing massacring anyone in this in this time period. Uh, so therefore, you're trying to position yourself as as the victim of all victims. And let me tell you, that's not true. Because while there may be Jewish people with that kind of viewpoint, um, I'm not among them. And I think learning about the real history of Israel-Palestine was a very painful experience for me. Mm. I grew up in a religious Zionist home. I was taught a uh, quite distorted history of Israel-Palestine. And when I started learning like the real history of Israel-Palestine in my 20s, it, it, it ripped me in half. I had a kind of fragile identity, uh, both as a Jew and as an Israeli. And it, it took learning it and it, it, it had to get worse before it got better, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't feel good and it probably took me about 10 years to put it all back together. I was, I felt very isolated. I felt very alone. I felt many people didn't want to talk to me about this issue. Um, and it was very painful. And it, it's an experience that I hope uh, other people can short circuit. Can you tell us more about the first time you felt like this is a part of your identity that you really couldn't speak about? Like, what are some of the conversations that you had been having? having i don't want you to like completely you know uh open your trauma but i want you to maybe say maybe talk about like what it felt like a little bit more because some of the people that are going to be watching this will feel that they're in the same situation by watching us talk about um this ukrainian um jewish uh relation relationship um and i just want to I just want to I just want us to connect with them in that way to say that like Lily, both Lily and I are not from groups of people who have never done bad things in their entire lives, right? We're not like vi blame like our histories are not full of like pure angelic victims who happen to be <laughs> in situations that they've never um you know, been aggressive or or like from groups of people who've never been aggressive. Like my family is from Haiti. Uh, my family participated in the Haitian Revolution. Um, one of my great, great, great uncles was one of the people who actually wrote and orchestrated some of the massacres. And so we're not oh, trying. Really? <laughs> so you're you're the bad one here. I'm the bad one. <laughs> okay. I don't want it, I don't want us to come off like we're woke scolding people, right? As the, <laughs> as the like internet that. the internet would say that we want Ukrainians to atone for the negative things their history that people that their ancestors have done. That's not what we're trying to do, but we want to make sure that people understand that you can have difficult conversations and difficult feelings about even standing on the right side of history, right? Sure. And you can feel alienated from having, you know, maybe people in your family supporting ideas that you don't support, and you still have to take a stand in on the right side of history. Absolutely. So to answer your question about Israel-Palestine, um, there's sort of little distortions at every part of the narrative, but I think there's really two that come to mind. First is that there was an ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 47, 48. 
Um, and I, I want to be really clear about my terminology here. Right? Ethnic cleansing is when you kick someone out as a way of resolving a conflict. You don't kill them as in genocide. You just you say, get out. And these are both crimes against humanity. These are both war crimes. And I think I kind of like roughly understood a little bit growing up because I knew that there was like this Palestinian refugees thing. It, but it wasn't until... You know, the way I was taught it is that the refugees themselves were blamed. You know, I was taught that, well, it was the um, Arab leaders who told them to flee and they thought they would come back riding on tanks and steal our homes, right? You know, so it's their fault, essentially, is what I was taught. Um, I think as I began to learn more about the history, there were some things that really stuck out to me. Number one, Many, not necessarily all, but were expelled. Uh, definitely in what Palestinians call uh, uh, Ramla and Lud, and what Israelis called or uh, Israelis call it Lod and Ramla. Um, they just expelled the whole cities. They were not positioned in a place that that the uh, the the government uh, wanted them to continue being there in a new Israel. And they, you know, there's accounts that you know, just everyone was forced to leave and people just streaming out in the highways. And that was tough to, you know, they didn't leave on their own. You know, mm. it's not at all. And then. Uh, many of the attacks on like villages, you know, you can kind of twist it. Oh, the conquering. I don't know what to tell you, but at the end of the day, they forced huge numbers of people out. Um, not not every single refugee was expelled. Some left to get out of a war zone, but everyone became a refugee in that Israel wouldn't let them return. Mm. So that was very painful to read because it's sort of like an original sin of Israel. And not just because it happened during the founding war, but also because Israel couldn't exist without it. Mm. That was really painful. When you begin to understand that 75, 80% of Palestinians in what would later, you know, the territory that would later be Israel, um, expelled or left and were not allowed to return as a matter of policy, uh, you, you understand that demographically there could not have been a Jewish majority. There was only a very slim, uh, I don't remember exactly, I think it was like 60, 40 in the areas that the UN said would be part of Israel. Um, but they had very high birth rates, so that very quickly would have been a Palestinian majority. So it was only with the expulsions and the expansion of territory that was never allotted to the Jewish state that you ended up with like a durable uh, Jewish majority and with the uh, the birth of the refugee problem. So learning that, you know, what what I valued as an Israeli and, um, you know, Israel, it's a complex place. It's a place that took in my family on both sides, some from Europe and some from the Arab world uh, as refugees. And mm. it was very painful for me to think, well, the very country that um, Maybe you know, possible. Yeah, that took in my family as refugees, made somebody else's family as refugees. So that was enormously painful. Um, I don't want to talk too much about Israel Palestine, so I'll just, just leave it at that. Like I, I would say that, that that was the Pandora's box. And once I learned that, I had to learn that uh, Israel is not the pure and holy player, that uh, both sides have been doing horrible things to each other, and that from an anti-colonial perspective, you really have to wrestle with uh, how Israel came about. And I think, I don't want to speak for you, but I think that you would also want Israel to move towards a place of being more democratic, more open, more pluralistic, just as we're asking of Ukraine and that the goal of human rights and democracy doesn't change because the people are different. Yeah. Is that is that correct? Is that a correct assertion? I mean, I, I do want Israel to be more democratic. And I, I think part of the way that the right wing populism that has been in power for so long in Israel hangs on to power is through this falsified history and what they teach in Israeli schools is essentially the narrative that I was taught and it makes 
the situation uh, more difficult to resolve. And history is absolutely used by governments to uh, mobilize people politically and inflame passions. So let's talk about some common concerns and objections to everything we just said. So some people tell me, hey, Lily, don't take this away from me. I need this. I need a national history. This isn't your history, you know, back off. What do you, what do you think of that argument? I think that argument, I mean, I wouldn't take that argument away from someone, right? But I also feel like you as a Jewish person and you as a Jewish person in this space have the right to have your opinions about what's going on, especially since your family has been involved in this history. Maybe not directly, but you know, having suffered through the Holocaust and having suffered through some of these atrocities, I think you have like a good uh, perspective that's needed to say, as we're as we've been talking about throughout the episode, that like we understand history is very painful and very triggering in in a multitude of ways. But also, we want to be able to have hope for the future. And I think you bring that kind of hope of like you support Ukraine and you believe in reconciliation and you believe that knowing history is the way to move forward so that we can not to be from a Christian household, but we can forgive each other (laughs) and and move on. And I think that, you know, that's that should be a welcome perspective. I agree with everything you're saying, but I think I'm even a little more positive about it because I just totally deny that the OWN is Ukrainian national history. Mm. If it was, I'd be open about it and say, okay, you got some difficult chapters. This is a myth. OMG. This was, you do not need this, uh, this, this little band of extremists in order to be a complete, proud Ukrainian patriot. That that's what they want you to think, right? Mm-hmm. That is what the ultranationalists and the own members themselves who came to have some positions of influence, they want you to put your identity in this double bind where you feel like if I lose this, you know, uh, my whole identity collapses. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the kind of, you know, authoritarian control of controlling the information environment in, in certain certain circles. And it's part of the way, in my view, that they victimized uh, a certain Ukrainian youth who heard this kind of thing growing up. Like, I just, I totally deny, like, this is not any significant major part of Ukrainian national history. They were not in any way a a majority in any part of Ukraine, including Western Ukraine. And I I just I just completely reject that you need the Oun and the Upa to have a, you know, Ukraine's such a wonderful place with such a wonderful language and culture Mm -hmm. and tradition and how how the Oun gets, you know, uh, you know, glorified in it is is troubling. Mm. Second concern, right, that people raise is, well, the Soviets made it all up. Well, they didn't, you know, I'm sorry. Like, again, read mainstream academic history uh, and just line up the same documents and see how they're used in the, the Ukrainian encyclopedia I mentioned. The Soviets did not make it up. The Oun made up that Soviets made it up. And I think what's so unpleasant about this is that it really ties back to the old idea of uh, Judeo Comuna, right? Judeo communism. Mm. And uh, in the in the memoirs themselves of uh, Nachtigal Battalion members, they they even wrote, "We well, we couldn't help ourselves, and we we massacred some Judeo Comuna, right?" And when when you do this. When, when you start saying that every time I open my mouth, it's Soviet propaganda, it's essentially Jiro Komuna again. Mm. You're portraying Jews as puppets of Russia. You're denying that we can have our, our own opinions, our own knowledge, our own history, and our ability to put forward 
um, our, our own narratives. Mm-hmm. And it, it's very unpleasant. And I, I unfortunately have seen this, Chris, that uh, I think some people just have heard this kind of thing enough that they're quite conditioned to just mm-hmm. be like, that's Russian propaganda. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, don't, don't do that. Let, let's, let's look at the history critically and openly. And I think, you know, Ukrainians have so many incredible superpowers, uh, the bravery, the steadfastness, the resistance to Russia, and so many things that's inspiring the entire democratic world now the ability to just automatically ignore something that a Jew says is not a superpower that anyone needs. Mm-hmm. Don't let this be your superpower. I agree. Uh, and yeah, in part, it features heavily in Russian propaganda and Soviet propaganda before then because of manipulation. They want to say that every attempt to have independence from Kremlin is equivalent to this group of fascists that committed atrocities. And that's the lie. The lie isn't. <laughs> that they committed atrocities. No, the lie is that uh, Ukrainian self-determination, independence, human rights, right to join NATO, right to join the EU is in any way tied up with the own or UPA or racism or anything like that. That's the lie. Another objection I get from people is, you're trying to make us into a perpetrator nation like Germany. You're trying to say that we're all bad or we have collective responsibility. And again, when you say that, you're giving in to the myth. You're giving in to the myth that the Oun and the Upa were some big significant part of Ukrainian national history. They probably killed more Ukrainians of other political persuasions than they ever did Jews. Mm-hmm. Like, if I felt this way, if I actually thought that Ukraine had done something specially unique and horrible during the Holocaust like Germany did, I would be honest about it and I would be open about it. But I just don't see it that way. I just, far more people were, you know, quote unquote, loyal to the Soviet Union. Obviously, I'm not pro-Soviet, but it's only if you're already in the trap of the ultranationalists and you come to accept that the own and the upa were somehow the real voice of the people only then do you kind of make yourself into a perpetrator nation i don't accept that for a second i think we need to take them off the pedestal and back into their place as marginal extremists who collaborated with the enemy during world war ii and no, I don't. I don't buy that. I do not think that uh, uh, Ukraine is should ever be mentioned in the same breath as as Germany or Italy during World War II. I agree. Okay. The next thing people say is this isn't the right time to talk about it. Wait till after the war. Hmm. What do you think of that, Chris? I don't know why they would say something like that because we're trying to move. But as we were talking about. Previously, we're trying to move the dial to move people, especially in the West here in America, to the pro-Ukraine side. And one thing that I do notice in activism is that people really relate to honesty. And this is precisely the right time to talk about it because we want to dismantle these myths that the Oun and the Opa were large parts of the Ukrainian population and that Um, this Soviet propaganda that Ukraine is equal to Nazism. We want to dismantle that that idea. And in order to dismantle that idea, we need to talk about historical facts. A small percentage of this uh, ultra right-wing nationalist group committed atrocities. um, And that doesn't mean that the Ukrainian people as a whole support them and the things that they did historically. This is the perfect time to talk about that, I think. And the people who think they support them today are only supporting the whitewash version they were taught that they were heroes. I don't know anyone who actually knows this history and still thinks that Bandera is a hero. Correct. Um, Yeah, I I agree. And also like, I think the ultranationalists are really weak right now. Like they are not the spirit of your own Maidan. They're not. Euromaidan was about joining the EU. It was about human rights, democracy, anti-kleptocracy, and all these things that I find so inspiring about Ukraine. They got nothing to do with that. The ultranationalists have nothing to do with the spirit of Euromaidan, at least in my opinion. And this is a moment where they're actually really weak because 
they don't want to talk about World War II right now. They have the independence movement that they support, and they understand that this is very, uh, this leads to a lot of opposition from minorities who suffered at the hands of the Oun and the Upa. In fact, I've been, you know, corresponding with a significant number of people from the older generation who believe this. Uh, and I have, you know, in my inbox uh, emails from one of the most hardcore deniers. Um, and uh, I don't want to mention who it is because truly this person is not important. Um, and all of a sudden he doesn't want to talk about World War II. Mm. This is a guy who's been stoking ethnic tension between Jews and Ukrainians in the U.S. and Canada so he can hold up uh, the Oun and Upa's heroes and, and, and spread this idea as to young Ukrainians. He, he spent at least 15 years that I know of um, pretending to be a historian, sending, you know, uh, propaganda letters back and forth and publishing and... All of a sudden, the guy doesn't want to talk about World War II. Why? Because the ultranationalists are in a very weak position now, and the liberal democratic impulse in Ukraine is super strong right now. So uh, in that respect, it's actually a great time to talk about it. Uh, the next thing I hear is, uh, well, they weren't all bad. You know, Lily, I acknowledge, and he here I'm channeling a, a Ukrainian journalist that I'm corresponding with, and he said, look, Okay, some members of the Oun and the Upa are Holocaust perpetrators, but you can't paint them all with one, you know, uh, uh, brushstroke. What, what do you think of this, like, you know, not all Upa members <laughs> kind of <laughs> argument? I, I'm having a hard time with the, don't put everyone in this category as like, a person who's done something bad um, argument because it's irrelevant. Um, because at the end of the day, they weren't actively trying to stop the other members of the Oun and Opa from massacring groups of people. So to me, that's an irrelevant argument. I think it is irrelevant. I mean, were all SS members bad? Did all SS members participate in atrocities? I, I, who is that really something that you like? Is that real historical inquiry? Who's mm. saying every single SS member committed an atrocity? Who's saying every single one was morally a bad person? What we can say is that this is a racist group that was involved in atrocities that flowed directly from their ideology and that the people who joined thought that this was a great idea. Yeah. Uh, minimally the racist ideology, I think we can say. One thing I'll say is that uh, the UPA actually forcibly conscripted people uh, later in the war. So uh, I will hold a little bit of space that um, there's people who, who didn't want to have anything to do with the UPA who ended up wearing their uniforms. So I'll, I'll hold a little bit of space for that mm. in much the same way, you know, Germany drafted people, including anti-Nazis. And, you know, OK, that's a difficult position to be in. I, I'm not in a, you know, I, I don't want to touch that. I, so I'll hold a little bit of space, but no, fundamentally the people who moved to Canada after and wrote these books and no, they're, they're, they're the terror itself. I'm sorry. Mm. Um, I, I, it's just complete red herring to be, we're all, we're all Confederate soldiers, bad people. Uh, who cares? Is that even a historical question that doesn't like, help us understand what the Confederacy was, what their ideology was, what impact it had on people. It, it's like a really, bizarre, how would we ever answer that question? Yeah, it, no you know, to. Especially in states that have drafts. So you, how could you possibly answer that question? Um, the other thing I'd wanna say about the not all UPA members thing. So some of the heroes in this in this crazy way of thinking would be not just UPA members, not just Oun members, not just Nachtigal members, but members of the uh, SS Galicia division. D Let me ask you this, parents listening to this podcast right now. Do you want your child to go to a school in the US and Canada, learn about the Holocaust, learn about the SS and then come home and then you need to tell them, hey, little Johnny or Alexi or whatever, <laughs> Alexander, 
not all SS men were bad. Some were <laughs> heroes. I mean, why why do you want to do that? Mm. Like, I, I would not want to do that to somebody's children. I wouldn't want it done to me. I wish I hadn't been taught some of the lies that were really painful to unpack. Do you want to create a situation where, where Jewish and other kids in class are pointing at your child and saying you're you're defending this? Yeah, why? Why? Why do you need this poison? I understand that you may have been taught it. You may have been taught this whitewashed version, this heroic mythic version. But once you find out the truth, I, I just cannot understand why someone would insist on passing this on. That's quite a thing. That's quite a thing to burden a child with. Mm. Hey, you you need to <laughs> You need to walk the tightrope of uh, supporting at least some members of Holocaust perpetrator groups. Does, does that make any sense to you, Chris? Like, you know? It doesn't make any sense to me. The only emotional perspective I could see is if some of you who are listening are, are descendants of some of the people who were in the Oun and the OPA, and you feel like this idea of that goodness or badness can be genetically inherited because a lot of this fascist racist ideology uh, is like gets boiled down to this like scientific racism idea and maybe you have a child and you're like hey yeah w even though they say this about our great grandfather he actually helped liberate ukraine if you are in that i would imagine small minority to think that it's really important for you to separate yourself from this idea that you've inherited uh, or it's or this thing is a personal attack. These historical facts are not personal attacks. We're not trying to attack you. Um, maybe we're saying that maybe an ancestor of yours did something horrific, but you personally are not the people that we're attacking. What we're talking about is making sure that we have a true accurate uh, historical understanding of what happened in the Ukraine at the time, especially to Jewish people and especially to Ukrainians who were massacred and murdered. And that from that, we want to have like a true history. And from that true history, we want reconciliation. Yeah. And if you're doing things and if you're poisoning the well, as it were, with propaganda or half truths, we're not working towards what you really want, right? When, you, when you're when you trying to say it didn't happen, what you want is for the bad thing to have never happened. There's no way to make that true. So, but, but what, you, what you can do is to say, I have this historical fact. Maybe I have a family member who I'm descendant of a family member who was a who did something bad, but that doesn't make me a bad person. And when I look at the history, I can say, oh, never again. Yeah. You know? You also don't know that your ancestor did something. Like yeah. my, my grandfather served in the uh, war of independence in Israel. I don't specifically know that he expelled anyone or, was, you know, I like, you know what I mean? For all I know, he was one of those heroes who just defended, you know, against the invading armies. There were members of the UPA, I'm sure, who defended people from the Soviets or, or whatever. Again, I don't, I don't say that to be like, oh, well, some were great. No, 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 no. All I'm trying to say is that unless you really know that some ancestor of yours like actually pulled a trigger, like you don't have that level of reckoning to deal with, and it doesn't need to be a part of your at least public sense of being Ukrainian. Yes. Okay. Um, another objection I hear is, well, I, I talked to some of these guys, or I interviewed some of these 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 old you know Unupa guys, and they were they were so great, and they were nice to their dogs and nice to their wives, and I I know these are good people, Chris. Mm. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how they treated the ethnic minority in Ukraine at the time. And yeah, but they said they said they're not anti-Semitic. I interviewed them and they said they love Jews, they love Poles. They told me this. Yeah. I guess people never lie. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's unreal, this hero worship of them. It's like, oh my God, they lied to you. Like, if you read the academic literature on this, they fabricated entire biographies. They mm. created a cult of themselves. They fabricated documents before the Holocaust was even done with. And wow. like, 
it's not even like terribly unique. After World War II, there was a group of historians, including uh, the Holocaust denier David Irving, only later would he be kind of understood as a Holocaust denier, who was perceived as sympathetic. And a lot of uh, uh, German soldiers and Nazi officials and things gave him documents and gave him their memoirs because they knew they'd get a sympathetic ear from mm. this community. So, I mean, I don't, they, they lied. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, it, it's so well documented that Owen and Wapa members in Canada and the US lied and lied and lied. And when you start to, are you a human lie detector? <laughs> Has your, did your father ever lie to you? Did your grandfather ever lie to you? It's like, come on, come to terms. Like, there's nothing unique about this. There's nothing unusual about this, you know? Mm. I understand that when you talk to them, you may have felt some emotional inspiration that inspired you towards the positive end of Ukrainian self-determination. Mm. But that does not mean what they told you is true. And it really pains me to see, there's like, you know, professors of Ukrainian studies who are like, well, this is like, a, you know, a thing we need to figure out. And these men were so interesting. And every chapter of, you know, their books could be a movie and maybe there will be movies. And I'm like, there's not going to be movies of them, not in the <laughs> United States, at least. Like, and if you really think every chapter of of their life's stories is true and is like, get a grip of yourself. Like, yeah. this is not real. They were already playing down the fascism during World War II, they got rid of the salute. During World War II, they changed the like 10 oaths or whatever it was from like murder to destroy. And mm. you know, like this cover up operation has been going on since 43. The lies are so well documented that you think because you met one or you saw an interview on TV where they, mm. they spread stories about how wonderful they were, that it couldn't possibly be false, you know, come on. You got, that's, that's tooth fairy stuff. Yeah. Next objection. This one was told to me by uh, a Ukrainian who was somewhat open to what I was saying. He said, well, because I said, well, what do you think? The Holocaust survivors lied? Is that what you really want to say? Right, we, we can just, you know, the Jews of Berlin already had accounts out in 1945 of what happened, in addition to testimonies in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, right? Already in 45, there were professional historians who knew exactly what happened and documented it. Um, and he said, everyone has their own truth. Oh. Oh. Everyone but, has their own truth, Chris. But isn't the isn't the goal of scholarly his, historical like s exploration to find out not everyone's individual truths but what really happened and how it is how does everyone's individual truths negate what actually the facts of the situation that's an interesting take to me yeah everyone has their own truth in some sense but they're just not all true yeah, you know, and, and to say that the own members have their truth and the Holocaust victims who were shot by Owen and Upa members have a different truth that erases the line between perpetrator and victim in a way that's unacceptable to me and not not because of some ethnic Jewish thing, but because of human rights and one of the moral high points of the United States was the war crimes investigations, not just in Nuremberg and in Europe, but also the OSI investigations where they found people who had fled to the US and Canada and prosecuted them. And it set uh, some of those standards we have now that we're gonna use to prosecute Russian war criminals who are mm. who are harming Ukrainian children and, and others today and, and committing these horrible atrocities. They're, they're built on this assumption that there's one reality and that you can use things like historical documents and survivor testimonies in order to prosecute people. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to rub it in anyone's face, but do we really want to say that the Wagnerites have one truth and the victims have another? I think, of course not. Yeah. Of course not. It's a terrible, terrible thing to say. And it's, it also implies that people's struggle is imaginary, that 
their victimization or like the real physical brutalities of having to experience uh, genocide uh, or ethnic cleansing is like in the person's mind that it's not as bad. It's like it's like positive. It's like toxic positivity. You know, <laughs> it's not as bad as you're saying. Like it wasn't when I hit you. It wasn't. It, you were just like, well, whatever. So I feel like that's very. I feel like that's actually even more dangerous in a lot of ways than complete denial because it makes it seem like yeah maybe what they're saying happened happened but it wasn't as bad it's like sometimes i see things online where they're like slaves some slave owners didn't treat their slaves badly so i don't understand slave revolts it's giving a bit of that uh half truth poisoning propaganda vibe that to me is so destruct disruptive to like reality yeah and it is it is not gonna make you too many too many friends yeah. uh, who have have been through something last last objection one one person told me well you know these guys you're reading are in the margins of ukrainian history you know studies read read timothy snyder for something mainstream uh, okay i understand a lot of ukrainians love timothy snyder a, a couple of remarks about this number one uh, all the scholars I'm talking to hold Snyder in high regard, and I don't think Snyder's ever written anything in opposition to them. So the idea that they're somehow at odds is is totally mistaken. Um, second, Snyder has written about this. He wrote an article, A Fascist Hero in Democratic Kiev. Mm. Okay, uh, so he, and this was in 2010 when Bandera got canonized, and he called them a fascist and a Holocaust perpetrator. So... Uh, when we talk about, you know, some people are more comfortable reading Snyder. The reason is because Snyder is writing from a broad perspective. He's not laser focusing on this question of the Holocaust and the Oun and the Upa, right? So in that sense, he's putting things in context that these were a small minority streams and that Ukrainians were by and large suffering massively during World War II and before that. And... He gives a lot of attention to Soviet atrocities and uh, Nazi German atrocities against Ukrainian. And in that sense, yeah, it's more comfortable to read someone like Snyder when this very difficult subject is a small part of what you're reading. But that uh, Snyder is not writing about this topic specifically. Uh, he's also not working on memory studies, which is like this area of like how societies remember the past and memory cultures and how it leads to ethnic division and reconciliation. That, that's just not his area, although he did write this article. Um, so uh, it's, it's just mistaken in, in my view. I mean, the sources being used by, you know, uh, uh, Kastyanov and Rudling and, and the studies and the authors who have really looked into this, they're exactly the same source material as what Timothy Snyder is using. Uh, it's just that Timothy Snyder is his academic interests are not taking down this web of falsification. He's just bypassing it and writing good history of Ukraine. And he's a very well respected scholar. You can go to defendinghistory.com, you know, David Katz's websites or what's it, Ernst? Um, Zundel, I forget, another Jewish guy who's on the forefront of combating Holocaust revisionism. They hold Snyder in high regard. There, there's no division here. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think what's happening is we're laser focusing on a very uncomfortable and difficult subject. But I hope if you've listened all the way to the end, you understand that we're doing it out of a good place because we want a a more pluralistic and inclusive pro-Ukraine movement and God willing Ukraine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, feel free if you want to dialogue about this painful and difficult subject. I, I am here and um, I'm not willing to give a platform to denial or to smears on Jewish survivors or, or anything like that. But if, if you are someone who was taught something that you now want to explore and you want to dig a little deeper into you know resources beyond what we put in the show notes um you feel free to reach out to me on social and and we can dialogue i understand this is difficult and i i am having these conversations with uh, a decent number of people right now until next time glory to the heroes and glory to ukraine bye bye